telling somebody earlier that I was happy to have a church that has been trained well enough that we don't have to get up and perform. But we can just worship. You don't, you don't need me. You don't need Pastor Lisa. You don't need us to just encourage you. Know we're here for that. But at the same time, you know how to worship. Kent Rogers, uh, who preached a few weeks ago for us, said complimented you remarkably he said i've been in a lot of churches ken and uh and he can call me ken i like to be called pastor around here because the kids as much as anything but he he said i I like it when i go to a church that knows how to embrace the lord and he said you guys were some of the easiest people to preach to he said what that tells me is they've been trained well I like it a lot, and I, I take that. You, there are certain men in my life, David Hogan, Kent Rogers. There's a few. There's a lot of people that want to be, but there's a few that when they talk, I really, it's like E.F. Hutton. <laughs> I've got to tune in and listen to what they got to say, and he was one of them. He was so complimentary of you, and I thank you for that because I think it's awesome that we have that this, today we're going to start this is the season of advent and we're starting that today and i'm going to actually light a candle and i'm going to talk to you about the candles that are in front of you because they represent different things and we're going to be covering different things as we go along but the first week if you can tell i don't use these very much is the candle that represents hope Bill Johnson, anybody know who he is? Anybody not know who he is? (laughs) Bill Johnson said this, hope is the joyous expectation of something good is going to happen to you. (laughs) Y'all didn't hear that, so I'm going to go over here. (laughs) Hope is the joyous expectation that something good is going to happen to you. Man. Hope is the fertile soil where faith grows. Oh, man, that's good. But there's a danger. As much as we need hope, there's a fight that's for our souls, for our minds, and everything that we have. How many knows what the enemy came to do? He came to. And so if he can steal your hope, you're in trouble. There's a danger in hopelessness. And there's something that psychiatrists and psychologists call learned hope hopelessness learned hopelessness and I have some examples of things that I want to share with you because I think it will help you but here's what I want you to see if you can learn hopelessness you can learn to have hope and optimism so there's something that that that, that we need to gather today in this season of hope And you need to get this message in you because there's too many people who have felt hopeless in these past years. Ever since COVID, we've been going through some stuff. Touch your neighbor and say, I've gone through some stuff. And I'm tired of it. But Martin, and I can't say the name right, so if I get it wrong, look it up and tell me later. Seligman and his his famous experiment said, Uh, that people could learn helplessness. And this was done in 1967. And he cited something that really just made a lot of sense to me. And that is that they can take an elephant. Anybody know how big an elephant is? They're pretty massive because Lisa and I happened to be on one. And where were we at? Uh, Thailand, I think. And it was literally about as tall as this roof to its shoulders and back where we sat. This thing was massive, and, and, and it literally, when it was standing, probably go from here to the wall easily. Massive, massive animal. But they have something called learned hopelessness, and they started doing the study actually because of the elephants, I, I understand. And so what they did, in different places, they would take an elephant when they were small, and they would put a chain around its leg, and then they would tie it to a piece of concrete in the ground. And the elephant, being small, couldn't do much about it. And when it would hit the end of its rope, so to speak, then all of a sudden it would stop. 
And so it did this and did this and did this. And in the interim, what happens is it starts having a learned behavior. And it goes for years this way. And then they sell it off to a circus or a zoo or something like that. And then you see them in the middle of a ring and they've got a little bitty rope attached to a peg in the ground. And they're four times the size they were when they were small. And they could, with one motion, rip that peg out of the ground and go. But they've learned hopelessness. Trained to give up. There was another experiment. And that was in, when did I tell you, 1967. There was another experiment, Pavlov's dogs. You remember that? How behaviors can be learned in dogs and animals I submit to you that they can also be learned by humans. And it's, it's sad that we have people who have learned hopelessness. During the 1950s, Dr. Curtis Racker uh, got some rats together. Some were domesticated rats, and I don't know what that means. And some were wild rats, and I don't know what that means. I think they're all wild. But he took them, and, and it's a horrible experiment in one way, but at the same time, I want you to get the point of what is being taught to us. He put those rats in water. And he put the wild ones in first. And after about 10 minutes, they began to give up. And suddenly, they were in a panic and the rats just sank to the bottom. When they did, they died. Now listen, you can look these experiments up. I'm not making this up just, just so I have something to preach. You can look it up. But I want you to see something. He took the domesticated rats. And he put them in the same water. And about nine and a half minutes in, when the others were beginning to get tired and gave up, these also began to get tired. But remember, they were domesticated. And he reached his hand in and pulled them out. And he took them and he dried them off. And he fed them. And he took care of them for about an hour. Same identical species. One domesticated. One's wild. Put them in the water again. This time, they swam 18 minutes. And just before they were about to give up and go under. Get me a microphone, somebody. Just before they were about to give up and go under, he reached his little hand in. Well, that's a good thing you got it then. Yeah. He reached his hand in and grabbed those rats again. And he pulled them out. And he set them up. And he fed them. He dried them off. He put them in a comfortable atmosphere for a little while. And then right back to the water, he took them. And he kept doing this until those rats, the same species, the same ones that had died in 10 minutes, swam 37 hours. What was the difference? Hope. Hope is the difference that it will make in your life. And Christ today is our hope. That's why I found that beautiful song. Man, I, I was at 1 a.m. last night. I was thinking, Lord, I, I, my, my throat won't hold up to do music today. I know that. I'll be, be doing good just to get through the preaching. And so I need your help and give me something. And I knew that the Lord had already given me a message on hope. Because he told me to tell you the rats have come to preach today. Because you need hope. And you need your situation changed. And, 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 and they took that study, and then the military took a hold of that study and went, and they developed another study from it. And some of you are shaking your heads already because you're military, and you know this. It's called PERMA. They spent $145 million to figure out how to make things work for people who are hopeless, and how to get them turned around and put on the right path. And so $145 million, I'm blown away. 
at how easily our government spends money. <laughs> the PERMA model represents five elements of happiness and well-being. PERMA basically stands for positive emotions, engagement, relationships, mission, and accomplishments. Positive emotions are a prime indicator of a flourishing individual. I wrote that myself. <laughs> That's good. Positive emotions are a prime indicator of flourishing individuals. But if you can learn hopelessness, you can learn positive emotions. Come on, somebody. And they looked for all this stuff and they spent all this money only to find what the Bible had already told us. Because the positive emotion that you need and are familiar with is found in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. And it says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. It is the joy of the Lord that causes me to be strong in the situation and to have hope in a hopeless time. I don't know about you, but I've had some setbacks. I, 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 I know some of you have had setbacks but I came to talk to you about a comeback from your setback because the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, in him and him alone, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I want to give you some advice, which Paul did when he wrote to, to the Philippians, and he said this, finally, brethren, Philippians 4, 8, he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything of any praise, think on these things. You will change your whole life if you learn to control the way that you think and you get the joy of the Lord back in your life. You'll have hope beyond hope and beyond any situation where you saw hopelessness before. You'll turn around and come out of that. That's pretty good preaching. <laughs> Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm the only one. But, but, but when I started putting this together, I, I kind of got excited. Hmm. Now, the study shows something, and this is actually from the study, so you, you, you need to listen to me. The study shows that it will help you to find a hero character who has been to hell <laughs> and defeated death and shows you how to live. I know somebody. <laughs> and it said in doing so, watch this. This is the study. They, they were writing a message. They just didn't. It says you'll find a new identity. I don't drop mics because they'll break, but that's a good point. I could just drop one. <laughs> yeah, they were. Everything that they spent $145 million to find out was already in the Bible. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus said. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Positive emotions. How do we get them? Turn our eyes. Y'all know that song? Turn your eyes. Look full. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Positive emotions. We can have positive emotions. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm about four minutes from being finished. You all right? All right. The second one, the, the P, positive emotion. The E, engagement. Most people can relate to getting caught up in a good book or in a movie. 
and getting so caught up that you lose all sense of time. Anybody done that? If you're going to overcome and get back in the flow, which is what they say you have to do is get back in the flow of life, you have to change your thinking, and then you need to engage. The rats kept swimming because they knew there was a faithful hand. which would reach down and rescue them at some point. Not when they wanted it, not when they thought it was convenient, but when the time was right, he'd reach in and he'd grab those rats and he'd pull them back out. And I, I, I just wonder if anybody's ever had the hand of God when you felt like you were drowning, when you felt like you were going under, when you felt like all was hopeless and there was no point in going on, if you've had the hand of God reach down and pick you up. People get caught up in activity or a task that focuses that, that with their focus and it totally engulfs who they are. So how do we engage? <laughs> this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you get this or not, but a few minutes ago, some of you had an engagement going on because the power of God was in the... My wife turned around during that one song called The Hope of Christ. She said, oh, I feel the anointing in there. I feel the Spirit of the Lord on this one. I feel Jesus up in this place. And I want you to know something. When you feel Je I, 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 I've been in situations. I've had money issues. I've had health issues. I've had problems. I don't know about you. I've had those things in my life. But there was something powerful about coming in and engaging with God to the point that I no longer was concerned about money or what bill was to be paid or what situation was in my body. But I was just worshiping my Savior, engaging So we need some positive emotions and engagement with the Lord. Then the third part, the, the R, is relationships. Human beings have a natural desire to connect with other people, to be a part of a tribe, a community, or a family. This is where your church comes in. Oh, give me some scripture. Thank you. I will. Where one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. Oh, 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 give me some New Testament something. I, I, I just need a little New Testament. Oh, oh, got you, got you. We're here. You ready? Where two or three are gathered. Oh, give me more. Okay, how about this? If two or three of you agree as touching any one thing, did you know divide and conquer is a military strategy? And, and did you know that Satan still uses military strategies against the church every day? And he's trying his best to divide you against your neighbor, against your friends, against your family, against the church. I love that song that we were singing. <laughs> it's so funny. And it says, we, we will not bow to the gods of man. Well, I heard somebody singing, and I eased over by them. And they weren't singing that because they just didn't hear it well. And they were just singing what they thought they heard. And they were saying, we will not bow to the gossip man. We will not bow to the gossip man. Oh, and, and, and at first it kind of struck me as funny. But then I got to thinking, hey, we will not bow to the gossip man. We will not bow to the gossip man. We're not going to do that because we need to. Listen, I need you. I don't care if you have a different political view or if you do something different or you don't like good country music and food and it doesn't matter. I need you. I'm going to say something. I really want you to get this. The problem you're facing is not to correct somebody else and make them who you think they ought to be. 
the problem you're facing, the solution is found in the people that you're trying to control. I, I don't think I could say this good enough. I can't change anybody. I have miserably failed trying. And the reason I say miserably, because there is nothing more miserable than me trying to change somebody else, and I can't do a dadgum thing about it. Can I say dadgum? That's better than the other word that almost came out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You can't change a soul, but you need everybody. <laughs> Jay and I fly together, and he's one of my favorite people on the planet right now because we fly together, in, among other things. But he's got such a great attitude. And actually, we're from the same neck of the woods. And so we understand each other better than some of you would understand us. <laughs> The other day we were flying in, and, and I, I don't remember, it's, it's been at least a month ago. We were flying into the airport over here, and he was giving me some instructions because he, he, that's what he does. And uh, the first time w we came in on that approach particularly, we were coming into runway 11, and the first time we were coming in, I was too low. There were some trees right there. And the danger is I'll land in the tree instead of on the runway. Not not a good thing, okay? Let me just clue you in. I didn't know how bad I needed him at that moment. <laughs> you, you, you don't get this. Because, see, if I land wrong, and, and I'll tell you this about flying, the most important thing you do is land. Right. Praise God. <laughs> but he was trying to tell me something. And listen. I couldn't hear him. I could hear him, but I couldn't hear him. I heard the noise, but I wasn't hearing the words with understanding. And he said two words, my airplane, which you know what that means? That means turn loose of it and let me have it. That's exactly what it means. I'm taking over. And thank God he did. See, you don't know how bad you need somebody that's sitting right there at some point in time that will say, I know what to do. My airplane, get your hands off. Let me take. That's people that are around you because God will inspire them to do things that are for your good and because they've had experiences that you haven't had yet. I need you. I need you. I need you. Mason, I need you. Not for selfish purpose, although it's, it's self-serving. <laughs> As iron sharpens iron. That's a good verse. I need you. When I'm weak, I need somebody to come by and say, you're going to make it. I need somebody to say, hands off. Let me put the throttle in. Let me pull back and let me just ease this thing in. And I'm struggling and I'm straining and I'm doing all that I know how to do. And sometimes the best thing you can do is what Carrie Underwood said, Jesus, take the wheel. And you look for Jesus to be a spiritual being. But I remember my dad singing this song growing up. Oh, to be his hand extended, reaching out to the oppressed. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus so that others can know and be blessed. I can, I, I can get emotional now. Because he showed me things. I still need my daddy. There are pictures of my mom and dad and my brother that are in my hallway. And I walk by and speak to them. Oh, that's crazy. They're gone. I think that God has a way. 
matter of fact, I've told people, if you need to get a message to them, just ask Jesus. Don't tell me he can't, don't tell me someone called the word can't take a word to somebody. That don't make no sense whatsoever to me. Come on, Jesus. Hmm. Hebrews 10, 24 says this, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We need each other. And much more as we see the day of Christ coming approaching. Positive attitudes, positive emotions. Help me out. Engagement. Relationships. The M stands for missions. A mission. You need something bigger than yourself. You need a mission. A mission will give you something to live for when you're bored out of your mind. Oh, my goodness. Mission equals meaningfulness or purpose. Without it, you're just going to struggle. Meaningfulness and happiness is derived from creating a meaningful life, not from a blind pursuit of material things, but actually doing something that matters. You know what the biggest problem is, is most people feel like, how many, and, and just, just be honest, and, and if, if you don't feel this way, don't put your hand up, but if you do, it'll be all right. How many feel like you were born for more than what you've been able to experience in life? Come on. In Brownsville, they did a song, There Must Be More. There must be more. The routine doesn't cut it. Come on. We get bored with the routine. We get tired of the routine. <laughs> yeah, we get stagnant. And we don't know what to do with ourselves. But God has given us some things in front of us like the church. Exodus 12 and 4. Watch this. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. What does that mean? It means that the lamb is never too small. No, notice that it doesn't say if your house is too big. If your problem is too big, if your situation is too bad. But what it says is if you got too much lamb, you're supposed to share it with your neighbor. So your mission becomes share it with my neighbor. Some of you need to really get this down on the inside and let it come out of you so that this season that we're in of hope, this season you're actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a time when you can freely share it. You don't need a pulpit. All you need is an opportunity. For some of you, this might be Revelation. I own an insurance company. I work this time of year with, with seniors. And I want to tell you something. You want to have some prayer meetings? Go to seniors' houses that are barely making it and trying to figure out how in the world am I going to even pay bills this month. And they're not playing games. They're sincere. Let me tell you about fixed incomes. They're broke. It's no joke. You say, well, they should have planned better. Well, they didn't. So what? Now what do we do? How can we help them? I, I, I particularly try and help them find a better way to do things in their life so that they can actually do things. And I use the Medicare program to do it, okay? Cat's out of the bag. Now you know. Since the 1st of, of October, I've seen 72 individuals in their homes many of them in desperate situations. 
they're in that box right now. Because I promised them. I promised them you'd pray. I promised them, I said, you know what, on Tuesday they'll pray, but nay, nay, I said every service. There'll be prayers over you every time somebody comes in the building. We're going to be praying for you. We're going to be praying for your economy. We're going to be praying for your health. We're going to be praying. For, we, we, for goodness sakes, we have a mission. What's our mission? Jeremiah 29, 11. I think it's in there, isn't it? I know the thoughts that I have towards you, the thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. What's our opportunity in this season is to share the hope of Jesus with a world that is obviously messed up and hurting. And they're looking for a kind word. I'm going to say something. It don't take much brains and intelligence to cuss somebody out. It doesn't take much brains and intelligence to criticize somebody and tell them what they're doing wrong. You see, you have to, I'll give you a huge examples. Look at all the complaints that come out of Washington. And they're pointing across the aisle. And it's always a complaint about this and a complaint about that. Not many solutions. Plenty of complaints. When we have the answer. And everybody is looking for hope. I know the plans that I have to give you a future and hope. To give you a future and the joyous expectation that something good is going to happen to you and your neighbor and your kids and your children and your children's children. See, I see people in here and I know some of the circumstances and so sometimes it's hard for me to preach knowing the circumstances because I don't know how to separate when I see Young ladies that are sitting here that lost their daddy. Or I see a sister sitting here who lost a sister. Or I see moms sitting here that's lost their children. It's hard for me to separate that. Knowing that you need hope. Well, here's the hope. It ain't over. <laughs> John 14, 1 said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, I'm going to come back and get you. There we will be together with them and him throughout eternity. And it ain't over, baby. The Apostle Paul talking about the rapture called it in, in the book of Titus the blessed hope of all believers. The blessed hope is that we are not going to die and just be like dogs and, and oh, oh, well, it's just dead. By the way, I can mess with that theory too. Where am I at? P E R M A. You ready for this one? We need some achievements. We need some wins. Hmm. We need to celebrate every time we get together and win something. You've got to have some wins. Win somebody to the Lord. That's what I wrote. <laughs> See, when, when the devil gets up and he attacks you, and he does, I like Jesse Duplantis' method of dealing with him. You're going to mess with me? You're going to mess with me? I'm going to mess with you. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to meet everybody I can, and I'm going to witness to them. Man, we, we were in, uh, Al, not Alpharetta, where were we at? Uh, Cherokee County, Canton, Canton, Georgia. And I walked into a restaurant up there. <laughs> I'll tell you two stories, maybe 20. 
me back to Alpharetta when you can. All right, but we were on the way up there. We were on the way up there, and I saw this guy. Man, we, we pulled into a place because it had a church's chicken. Now, look, if you ain't had church's chicken, <laughs> I don't even know how to help you right now. <laughs> oh, oh, my word. It's, it's almost like grandma's. Matter of fact, they put a church's in down on Wickham Road. Y'all remember this? And if you looked at it from outside, you thought they're never going to go out of business because you, you go down there and get in line. It was a quarter mile down the road, not in the parking lot going around, down the road to turn in to get to the place where you can place an order. And you think, man, this ain't never going to go out of business. COVID took them out. Mm, learned hopelessness took them out. Amen. We pulled into that place, and it was a gas station, and it had Church's Chicken in there, and there was a guy there with a flat tire. Now, when I say big, Alan, he was bigger than you. He was about 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, we got a couple big guys in here, it's, it, and, and I'm not throwing anything against him. I'm just telling you, this dude was big. And we were in a part of town where my skin color didn't really work too well, and I, I'm not... No, I'm not prejudiced at all. I just want you to know this. And I, and I walked over to him, and I said to him, Hey, sir, how you doing? Get my hand right. You know, felt a little weird for a second. <laughs> I said, how, How's it going? He said, Well, I've got a flat tire and said a few choice words. I said this to him. When's the last time somebody told you that Jesus loves you and that God has a plan for your life? And this big guy who was angry, upset, and hurting started crying. Man, you don't know how bad I needed to hear that today. What are you? I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just a Christian. I'm an agent of hope. Because I have hope. You can have hope. We prayed and he cried. I was, you know, in the natural, he could have squashed me like a bug. We went up to Canton. We were in the restaurant. Lady was taking our orders. Oh, Charlie's. We were in that restaurant and she was taking our orders. And, and, and I looked at her. I said, hey, honey, can I ask you a question? She said, what's that? She thought I wanted something off the menu or something. I said, when's the last time somebody told you that Jesus loves you and God has a plan for your life? She started crying. My granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. The last time I heard that, I was about 12. And she said, excuse me, and she ran into the back. And it shook her up so badly that somebody cared enough to offer hope. She couldn't continue to wait on us. Oh, that's bad, Brother Kenton. No, 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 no. I just turned her over to the one that could do something about her situation. I did see her before I left, and, and we spoke briefly. But you could see it. The world is hurting. The world has learned hopelessness. I, I, I'd ask for a show of hands, but there's no need. I'll just tell you about me. My school teachers told me I was stupid that I'd never amount to anything, that they were just going to kick me out of school. One threatened to keep me in school. I said, if I do, I'm coming back to your class. <laughs> that, that's a true story. And I said, you ain't begin to see that side of me yet. <laughs> so I got out by the grace of God. Made it out of high school with a 2.2 average. I, I mean, I was floating, floating high, wasn't I? I was dyslexic, and they didn't know it. 
I didn't know. I didn't even know what it was. They said you'd see words backwards. I never saw words backwards, so I couldn't be dyslexic, right? And so, so here I go. I'm going through high school. I get through. Y'all remember this? Get up and read this paragraph. Uh, 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 major panic. And then the smartest kid in the room would always be quick to correct you. And this is the word stupid. That's how I heard it. I needed some hope. And I learned I had some problems. Let me say, you shouldn't admit your problems. Let me just tell you something. Jesus is bigger than my problem. Amen. Me admitting that I had a problem was not a problem. Amen. He's bigger than my problem that I had. Amen. And I believe in positive confession with the best of them. I really do. But at the same time, if I got a broke arm, it's kind of silly for me to go, no, it's not broke. <laughs> How about it's broke and God's going to fix it? I'm a, my wife's finger was broke. I saw the x-ray. It was broke. But Jesus is fixing it even as we speak. Now, now I'm all over the place because healing is progressive. It's, what am I at? Where am I at? W winning. Winning. We just need some wins. Ecclesiastes says that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. Bible says, despise not the days of small beginnings. Hmm. Romans 8.37 said, we are more than conquerors. And God wants you to be filled with hope. I need to talk right now, and I'm almost finished. I promise to be through in less than an hour. Okay. I want you to listen, and I want you to listen to me good. What does it mean when it says you're more than a conqueror? Let me explain that to you. If you were raised in poverty, as many of us were, and you're able to scratch and work your way out of and learn some skills and do the things that you need to, let me go another way. If you were ever in an addiction and you had to claw and scratch and dig your way out of that mess, if you were ever a smoker, And you had to, when I started smoking, I skipped school and I smoked in second grade, guys. I was setting records, okay? And you know what? When I started smoking, it made me sick. It really did. You know what I had to say to myself? Shut up and take it. You look like a man. Impressive, isn't it? So when I got ready to quit, you know what I had to tell myself? Shut up and take it. Because now you're a man. When I became a man, I put away. Now here's the thing. That makes me a conqueror. Getting out of the neighborhood I grew up in, which was not a bad neighborhood, but to get out of it and scratch my way to... To, to good successful status pretty cool now that made me a conqueror handing Lisa the check when it came in that made her more than a conqueror <laughs> 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 yeah. you want to be more than a conqueror you go back to the same neighborhood and you say come on Get up here with me. And you pull them out. You pull them out. You say, I don't care what has been thrown at you. I told your mom this. You're better than this. You can condemn somebody. She was struggling with an addiction. And I just told her, I said, Vesta, you're better than this. You're better than a vapor. You're 
better than an alcoholic. You're better than a drug addict. Together, we can have some wins. Hmm. The guy in the Bible that you want to know about is found in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, and David was greatly distressed. Now, he could have stopped. The people spoke of stoning him because his soul, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. And everybody was upset. But David encouraged himself. Why? Because he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God, because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Romans 12 and 12 says this, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Zechariah 9, 2, Return to the stronghold, you prisoners. You, you didn't get this. You prisoners of hope. What does that mean? I, I need a volunteer, anybody, just somebody. Come, hey. All right. Here you go. What that means is go wherever you want to. Go. You know what this is? Him dragging hope. <laughs> He's a prisoner. He can't go but so far because I'll snatch him back. <laughs> prisoner of hope. So, here's what I want us to do. I got a, a video, and I want you to stand up on your feet, and, and, and just g give me a second, and as you, oh, that's fine, <laughs> <laughs> up and down, never hurt anybody, no. <laughs> blood flow. Because... <laughs> You need to know how to turn it around. You've had the setback. Now it's time for the comeback. You've had a setback. Now it's time for a comeback. You've had a setback. Girls, you've had a setback. So we need to know how to fight. Put that on, please. <laughs> 